You're listening to Life of the Record, classic albums told by the people who made them. My name is Dan Nordheim. Of Montreal formed in Athens, Georgia in 1996 by Kevin Barnes. After signing with Barn on Records, Kevin started working with a rotating lineup of band members as Of Montreal released their debut album, Cherry Peel, in 1997. The bedside drama, The Gay Parade, Coquelicot Asleep in the Poppies, and Ald Hills Arboretum followed before they signed with Polyvinyl Records. Kevin began working primarily alone and released Satanic Panic in the Attic in 2004 and The Sunlandic Twins in 2005. While living in Norway with their wife and baby, Kevin turned their attention to the next album. Hissing Fauna, Are You the Destroyer was eventually released in 2007. In this episode, for the 15th anniversary, Kevin Barnes looks back on how Hissing Fauna came together. This is the making of Hissing Fauna, Are You the Destroyer. Uh, this is Kevin Barnes from the band of Montreal, and we are going to be talking about Hissing Fauna, Are You the Destroyer? I feel like with everything I make, it's, everything is very organic, and it just sort of happens on some like unconscious level. I'm just driven to do it, and I try not to be self-conscious. I try not to second-guess anything, because I figure, okay, I'm just going to write and record, and then there'll be time later to decide, like, what I want to include, what I want to erase, what I want to change. So everything that, that I was singing and writing at that time was, was very much connected to what was going on in my inner world. So like things like, I'm in a crisis, I need help. You know, like that's just how I felt at that time, like excited about having a child, but also terrified about having to become like a real adult because... Up to that point, I'd just been sort of in my you know daydream world all the time, and never really had to like take care of something, never had the pressure of that and when as we were getting closer to nine months that it just kind of got more and more extreme and more and more intense, and also to make matters worse, I was so completely unable to really take care of even myself financially, let alone another creature. So it was just like a really crazy fucked up situation to be in just on a you know personal level. So I think that all of that chaos led to you know the songs that are on the record. I don't really think of it as like my best record or anything like that. So it's kind of just, to me, it's a bit arbitrary, like why Hissing Fauna is the one that people seem to like the most. I think of it as sort of like the anxiety depression album because in a lot of ways it is, you know, it's like what I was going through at that time before I got on medication and I was going crazy. I didn't know what was going on with me. I had never really experienced uh, anything like that. It was such an extreme experience that it feels probably more powerful in a way. Cherry Peel, the first record, was very personal. And then I sort of got away from that and and wanted to live or just create these sort of more fantastical types of albums and not really put too much of my like personal private life into the records. And then Hissing Fauna was definitely more of a return to that of like, what's going on, 
in my personal life, it should be like really transparent, you know, like I'm going to sing about what's real, sing about what's happening and not, you know, create some outrageous characters that I, that I would invent so that I didn't have to write about myself or sing about myself. So maybe that's why people connected with it more, you know, that there hadn't been a bunch of songs about depression or anxiety, really. And I think that maybe the vulnerability of it is what appeals to people and just kind of making people feel like they're not alone in having those those feelings and having these experiences. I mean, we are completely obscure for the first, like, six records, five or six records. And then we signed a polyvinyl and put out Satanic Panic in the Attic. And then that was, like, the first real taste of any kind of, like, commercial success or any sort of, like, boost in our popularity. Sun Atlantic Twins, the record before Hissing Fauna, was very, was also like another like step forward. And it was like, wow, people seem to really like of Montreal for some reason right now. This is cool. But there's a lot of stuff going on in my personal life at that time. So I, I had been married for about a, a year when Sun Atlantic Twins came out and my wife was pregnant, like nine months pregnant, I think, when Sun Atlantic Twins was released or like basically like right around the time where my daughter was born. And I wasn't making enough money at that time to really think that oh, this is a, a way I'll be able to support my family. And so there was a lot of like stress in my life, a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety. But so I was still trying to like keep everything going and went on tour a bunch with Sunlight Twins and the record was doing very well and we were playing to larger audiences. And so on that level, it was very positive. But at the same time, to do that as your form of earning money. You have to be away from your family. So to be away from my daughter, you know, like newly born and my wife and all the stress that she was feeling was pretty intense as well. And and so it put me in a very strange place psychologically because I was happy that the record was doing really well, happy that my career was sort of taking off, but then also torn because to do what I wanted to do and needed to do, I had to basically kind of like abandon my family to do it, at least physically, I couldn't be there physically. So that created a rift between uh, my wife and I and a lot of stress and, and stuff was connected to that. And then we actually split up and she, she's Norwegian. She went back to Norway and took our daughter with her. So that was basically like where my mind was at, where my where my life was at when I started working on Hissing Fauna. Yeah, the Georgie Fruit creation is sort of, you could see it being like when someone goes through a traumatic experience and it creates like a split personality disorder or something, or just like you kind of create these other characters, personas that you can escape into. So I think that the Georgie Fruit character was something that psychologically I, I created unconsciously and just sort of fell into and it was a way to escape from all the pain and anxiety and, and depression and, and pressure and stress that was going on in my life and wanting to be free of it and be more carefree and less burdened. I think that for me creating the Georgie Fruit character, that it was basically me deciding like how I wanted to be perceived and even just on my own level of like how I want to perceive myself. And growing up, you know, in like suburban America with like pretty conservative, you know, pretty normal parents. And, you know, it wasn't really the kind of life where you have access to all the information that we have now, you know, pre-internet and all that. So my like gender perception was very much informed by that upbringing, whereas like you know, it's very limited, like what you can do, how you can feel or how you can identify. So, you know, it's just like man, woman, that's it. 
But I always felt like I was definitely somewhere in the middle, you know, a third gender or whatever. But I didn't really know that much about it and never really uh, spent a lot of time researching it, just sort of like living in the moment and having certain feelings about it or having certain changing views about how I want to be identified by other people. Uh, during the Sunlag Twins tour, I started getting more into gender bending, more into like being outrageous or whatever, just like getting more into like partying. And, you know, it's like a very unhealthy thing that I was doing, but I was mixing anti-anxiety drugs and alcohol, which can definitely create some dicey experiences. So it was definitely a form of escapism to um, be this outrageous character and be sort of glamorous and this character that is pretty far from, you know, my childhood, pretty far from the person that I was able to be up to that point. And the people were enjoying it and the concerts were really great and everything seemed to be flowing really well on that level. And so, yeah, getting into this party mode and all the trappings that come with it were, think, you know, songs like uh, Bunny Ain't No Kind of Rider, Suffer for Fashion are sort of connected to that, that sort of party animal, party monster aspect of the Georgie Fruit character. We got to keep our little click clicking at 1.30 BPM, it's not too slow. If we got to burn out, let's do it together. Let's all bow down together. Together. Let's go together. Let's do it together. Let's go together. So I went out to Norway uh, in between Sun Atlantic Twins tours because I really missed them both and really, you know, didn't want Alibi to not have a father. So went to visit them and Nina and I patched things up and she agreed to come back to Athens and for us to live together again. So in that time, uh, some of the songs that I made were after they came back. Suffer for Fashion actually was one of the songs I made after they came back. I think of the music and how I want it to, to flow together and very much influenced by the concept albums of the 60s and 70s. And I always thought it was cool, you know, the way certain songs flow together on classic records like the White Album or Sgt. Pepper's or whatever. And for there not to be just like, you know, the typical three seconds of space in between each song or whatever. I always think it's really cool when you can't really tell where one song ends and one song starts, or even just trying, just the challenge of trying to make things flow together in that way musically is, is always cool. So I did a lot of that on Sun Atlantic Twins and that kind of just carried over into Hissing Fauna, I guess. But Suffer for Fashion is, seemed like a good intro song just because it is more upbeat and you know, I started thinking about that, how like the Beatles and the Stones and people like that, or I guess maybe it's just kind of like a thing that a lot of artists do is like, yeah, you want to put like a real peppy song up front. It's kind of like a concert or something. If you go to see a band play and the first song they play is super down tempo, there's no momentum anymore. You know, it's like you have all the momentum in the world before you come on stage and then you get to dictate like what the energy of the experience is going to be. So a lot of times I do want to start with like a more upbeat song so that it feels good to be listening to the record and you want to get deeper into it. Let's go together. Let's do it together. Let's go together. Yeah, with that one, sink the, s I think you say sen, sink the sen. I think that's the way the Frenchies would say it. Even though I say sink, 
I think I say sink the Seine in the song because I'm an idiot American. But I made that song in Norway. A friend of ours had this factory, like abandoned factory space that they were using for to put on this art production, a theatrical production that they were working on. And it was a huge old factory. I can't remember what kind of factory it was, but it was humongous. And there was all these extra rooms and very cold and drafty in the winter. You had to have like a space heater in the room or whatever. You'd freeze to death. But so that was where I worked on a couple of songs just to have like a space where I could be away from everybody. That song, Sink the Sun, was there. They had, there was an organ that just happened to be in one of the rooms. I can't remember why, but that's what I played on that song. And also, I think there was a bass guitar there. So it was like basically just like whatever instruments happened to be around. I would use and try to write something with just, you know, kind of escape from what was going on in my life and just try to have a little bit of fun. So that one, yeah, I just made in this like tiny little room. There's just a little organ there and it just kind of happened. Yeah, so for some of the songs, I was doing that rewire thing where you have logic and reason running at the same time, which now you don't have to do anymore. So that was how I did that. I had a laptop and and had the drums in reason, and then everything else was real instruments, you know, like the vocals and the bass and the organ. There was a brief period where... Sink the Sun, Kato's Upon, Heimdall's Gata, Grand Lanik Gata, and Sentence of Sorts and Kongsvinger were more bare-boned and they uh, didn't have a bunch of extra stuff added to them. They were mostly just things that I did in reason. But then later, once I got home, and then I added some other things to them. I think that when I was doing like Kato as a pun, I was basically just, I had like a tiny little MIDI keyboard and just kind of fooling around, just like, just making a little song, not thinking too deeply about it, you know, just like having fun, put the headphones on and just make a song. I'm not thinking about it as being like a thing that I'm going to release or play for anyone ever, just like something to do with my time that is more positive than, you know, sort of ruminating over how I'm going to be a horrible father or whatever. The people that we were staying with in Norway had a cat that they named Kato. And, you know, it's like, obviously, it's a play on words to call your cat Kato in a way. So that was kind of like Kato as a pun was a connection to that. So a lot of the song titles are connected to living in Norway. Heimdallsgata is the street that we were living on while we were in Norway. And Grönlandic is the neighborhood that we were living in. Kongsvinger is the city that my ex-wife's family lived where we used to go. And so that whole section is very much connected to that experience in Norway. But yeah, Kato is a pun. It's like, it's not really about, has nothing to do with the cat really. But the second verse is kind of more about, I can't even pretend like we're friends. There's, I've written a lot of songs about like different people, like different friendships that were sort of fizzling out or were sort of toxic. And so that the second verse is kind of about that, like, how I kind of felt that I wasn't really emotionally supported by the people in my life at that time. You know, it's troubling when you're going through a difficult period and you don't feel like anyone gives a shit. And on top of that, they're like adding more stress because they're bitching to you about something that you can't control. So that's a very, I would say, a very unhappy song. I can't even pretend that you 
are my friends What has happened to you and I And don't say that I have changed Cause man of course I have Are you far too depressed Now even to answer the phone I guess you just want to Shave your head have a drink and be left alone. Satanic Panic in the Attic was the first record that I did almost exclusively by myself. And so all the other records, I had other people who were contributing. And definitely, like, The Gay Parade, Coco Go Sleep and the Poppies, and All Hills Operatum were more band records in that, like, pretty much every single song had one or two or three or four other people playing on it. And then after Alt Hills Arboretum, the people that I had been playing, or a bunch of the people that I've been playing with decided they didn't want to be in the band anymore. Um, that was like right around the time where I got married and Nina and I moved in with my brother and I had, I still had like some recording gear. And so it's kind of just, you know, the one consistent in my life has always been that I just want to be working on music all the time. So I had some recording gear in this one bedroom that an extra bedroom that we had and set up there and made satanic panic in the attic but i was kind of thinking like well the band's maybe done forever i don't know what's going on but i'm just going to make this record so i make satanic panic in the attic and then people seem to like it disconnect the dots gets played on like mtv i can't remember what the show was called but it's some like indie rock MTV show that they had. And I was like, okay, cool. Like things are starting to go well. College radio seems to like it. We're getting, you know, invited to play these cool shows. And so then people want to get back in the band. So it was easier to find some musicians. And then like some of the people that had been in the band before still wanted to be in the band. So everything was like kind of chill then. But then when I made Sunlight and Twins totally by myself again, they're like, what the fuck? You're, now you're just going to completely like freeze us out. We're not going to be involved in any of this stuff. And I was like, yeah, I guess so. Because <laughs> I just want... It's very therapeutic for me. You know, I'm, of course, it's therapeutic for them as well. But for me, it's like, I, it's, you know, I need to be in the studio with the headphones on, just escaping and creating. And it's so fulfilling to do that. And I don't need necessarily, unless I want, I might want other people to be involved, but I don't really need other people to be involved to like do the things that I want to do. And it's kind of easier if I can just, and it's more fun if I can do the things myself. I can play the keyboards myself, play the bass myself, you know, do whatever it is myself. So th at that time, especially, I just didn't really think that much about including other people. So it would hurt their feelings. Well, one person in particular hurt their feelings the most. And so it was kind of like a weird thing that I was going through where I was like, on a lot of levels, things are great. On a lot of levels, things are horrible. And I'm just kind of absorbing all of it and feeling all of it. And it's a bit overwhelming. I'm in a crisis. Yeah, with Heimdos Gata, I was trying to make something more positive feeling because in general, like if I'm, if I'm feeling super depressed, stressed out, frustrated, miserable, I don't always make music that matches that mood. I often will try to make music that will pull me out of that state of mind. So I was trying to make like the poppiest, happiest sounding music. And I didn't have any lyrics or really melody lines or anything when I was making it. I was just trying to create something that felt more positive so that I wouldn't have to just sort of dissolve into a state of misery. But then once the music was done, I you know, was deeply depressed and I wasn't just going to sing about some like trivial, superficial, happy thing because I couldn't do it. I wanted to sing about something that was more connected to what was going on. So 
singing about that, you know, singing about what's going on with the chemicals in my brain. Why am I unable to enjoy life? Why do I feel like I'm under attack? And um, so, yeah, singing, I'm in a crisis, I need help. Come on, mood shift. Because, you know, there's sort of realization that it could be anything, any any like moment in time, you could feel anything. You could feel like excruciating pain. You could feel, you know, incredible ecstasy. And a lot of it, you don't really have any control over, you know, it's just what's happening and you're just like dealing with it. So as sort of that feeling of like, come on, something change, something get better. Of course, like there are things you can do to make your mood better, you know, wh- whether it be like exercising more, yoga, breathing exercise, whatever. It's not going to like completely cure the problem or even like, you know, sometimes you have to break up your marriage because you can't function. You're not functioning properly and you need some space to get your head together. So that was kind of like, I think the problem is like the two things were like, sort of like butting heads where I was like, I really don't want to be relied on 100% of the time. I don't want to be, I don't want to have to be a reliable person. I'm like an artist. I'm a freak. I'm a weirdo. I'm like unpredictable. This is scary for me, you know? So just that whole thing was hard. It was a hard transition to make. of like, I need to be more reliable and predictable. Ugh. I think that you know played a big part of it, and then also just the terror of being unable to support my wife and my daughter financially was you know pretty intense. And at this point, totally broke. Having we didn't have a house, <clears throat> we didn't have an apartment, we didn't have a place to live. Everything was in storage. So it wasn't until after his fauna, like after Nina and I got back together, his fauna comes out. That's when like all these like things like the Outback Steakhouse thing, the T-Mobile thing, like all like the weird corporate stuff was coming in. We play like Coachella, we play like Lollapalooza, like all the all that shit happened like after Hissing Fauna came out. So yeah, it's just like all these things. I didn't realize at the time, it's like, man, you'll just figure it out. It'll be okay. <laughs> at the time it seemed like, I don't know how it's even gonna happen. Like we're fucked, everything is fucked. <laughs> Um, so Grand Atlantic Edit is, the title, yeah, is, is referencing the neighborhood that we lived in, in Norway, and the anxiety that I was feeling, like, the paranoia, the fear had gotten so extreme where I couldn't even really, like, leave the house. And Norway in the winter is, is pretty oppressive. I mean, the sun is only up for a few hours, it's cold, it's gray. And if you don't get into what it has to offer as far as, like, I don't know what, like, skiing or ice skating, I don't know, like snowy things. If you're kind of just like a depressed person, it just it's pretty extreme, like what you have to go through, no sunlight, or just the way it feels, you know. I feel, I have like, you know, pretty bad seasonal depression anyway, so like that's like a very extreme environment where you get almost no sunlight. It's just like you feel like, you know, it's just endlessly dark, endlessly nighttime. And if you sleep in because you're depressed, then you'd miss whatever little light you might have gotten. So, 
you know, I was joking. It's, I was like kind of just like playing around, like I'm satisfied living in a friend's apartment and only leaving once a day to buy groceries. So yeah, that song is just about my state of mind while I was living in Norway and being in that depressed, anxiety-ridden state of mind. I am satisfied Hiding in our friend's apartment Only leaving once a day To buy some groceries Daylight, I'm so absent-minded Nighttime meeting new anxieties That's sort of like, you know, wanting to have some sort of religious or not religious, but spiritual life or some sort of grounding aspect in your life, but feeling like it's all bullshit. And so what do you do even, you know, it would be nice to give my heart to a God, but which one do I choose? You know, that's like the joke is like, it's all made up. So like, what fictitious, what fictional God are you going to give your heart to? And like, not really feeling like, oh, this is like a legitimate thing. Like the people who do this are just, you know, delusional, just living in a fantasy world. And, but still it's a very real need. That's why I don't really, you know, try not to criticize people for being Catholic, even though like I grew up thinking it it was bullshit because I understand the need. I understand like why people want to have that it's terrifying, you know, to not have that in a lot of ways, if you think about it at all. So I get it. I understand the need. I'm like everybody else. I have the same need, but I can't do it if I don't believe in it. So it's pretty much about that. Oh, the church is filled with losers, psycho or confused. I just want to hold the And also growing up Catholic as well. Like I was raised Catholic, went to church for 18 years every Sunday, went to Catholic school. My mom was a Bible studies teacher. But I always thought it was a joke. I never, for even a millisecond, believed any of it or cared about any of it. But I still had to go. So it was like kind of torturous to just sit, have to sit there in church and just see this weird charade play out every Sunday and like the whole thing of like getting up with my sisters and my brother and all of us piling into the car and the smell of perfume and makeup. And it was very intense, visceral experience. And then I was even an altar boy for a while. So like wearing like the weird little child vestments and shaking the incense can and doing that whole thing. So yeah, raised you know, definitely raised in the church or whatever, but never really thinking like this is normal or this is like a good thing for humans to be involved with. But I think that, you know, having that experience was actually cool for me just to kind of like see what life is like inside of that world. You know, the, the weird, like uptight conservative world. I'm like, God, how do you fucking survive? Like nothing... What it, like thrills you? What excites you? Just every day being exactly the same? Like how could that give any meaning to your life? And the craziest thing is like with everybody and anything that like you could change so quickly and everything up to that point just dissolves because now you're a new person and a new thing. So there's like absolutely no reason to cling to any feeling that you have about what you are, what, what yourself is or whatever your identity. So I think that that, I knew that at an early age, but it's interesting when you, you're not surrounded by other people who are like, yeah, I agree with you. That makes sense. You know, you're surrounded by people like you're crazy. Yeah. 
Understand and like appreciate the function of performance, and also the voyeuristic function of like going to see another person perform. That it can be like very transportive and cathartic, you know, to not only be the performer but also to be in the audience and watch somebody else performing. Because you know, it's like they say in in dreams, you're every character, and I think it holds true in life. In a lot of ways, we're every person that we see, as well as being ourselves. So I think of you know that like I guess it would be nice to help in your escape, and to sort of realizing though like as the person that's on stage and prancing around and being cheered for, it can be like actually great because you know it feels exciting obviously to be prancing around on stage and people are into it. But at the same time, I know it's sort of like an empty thing that like eventually. People leave. You're alone again, and you can't just be the indie star, you know, for yourself as well. So it's kind of a fleeting moment. So in, in a lot of ways, like fleeting moments, I feel like are potentially kind of superficial, in that they can't really like fulfill you completely forever. You've come my back in my city. Yeah, I think I made this one actually in Kongsvinger. We were staying in my ex-wife's、uh, childhood bedroom because it was like her childhood home that her parents still lived in. So it was kind of like this weird, just like sitting at this little desk that she must have sat at doing homework and stuff when she was in high school and working on this song. That was another one where I was like deeply depressed and trying to make something that felt really positive to sort of like pull myself out of it. It has that sort of like disco strings that that was something that I did in Reason, and I think the name of the sample was like Disco Trill or something. <laughs> But yeah, I was thinking of something, trying to make something that kind of like ABBA, Bee Gees sort of feeling. Kind of discoy and, but really poppy and catchy. So the record is kind of split in half in a way. Where like, first half were songs that I had written and recorded while I was still with my wife and still you know like doing the family thing, and and then the second half was when we had split up.、Um, well, the past is a grotesque animal would have been after we broke up because that's all about the breakup and all about just、uh, the frustration and the struggle that was going on. But yeah, so that's sort of like in the middle that separates the two pieces, maybe, or it could be more connected to the second half. Yeah, it's definitely kind of an outlier. It doesn't. I definitely hadn't ever made a song like that before. I can't really like the whole thing just happened sort of organically, and I don't really remember what inspired me to just to begin it. But 
I think that a lot of times I go into the studio or go into the bedroom or whatever it is, whatever space I'm working in and just sort of start. And then just these things just sort of happen organically. And, and then it's kind of like this train that just like leaves the station and you just have to like chase after it. That one, uh, lyrically, I just like basically went through this journal that I was keeping. And I often will keep like a songwriting journal. So yeah, just kind of like went and looked through the journal and, and looked at all the different lines that I had written down and chose like which ones I wanted to use. And it's very much, you know, sort of like an open letter to Nina because, you know, just directly talking to her the whole song and talking about our life together, things that we'd experienced. And at this point we were broken up. So I was reflecting on our time together and just, you know, kind of communicating directly to her. The past is a grotesque animal And in its eyes you see How completely wrong you can be Yeah, I remember when I was done recording it, I felt a little bit self-conscious because it's like, it is very emotionally bare and very vulnerable. And I hadn't really done that very much in the past. I guess I did it more on Cherry Peel and then I stepped away from it because the criticism that Cherry Peel received made me feel like, oh, I don't really want to share my inner world with anybody else because then they'll make fun of me for it or whatever. So I kind of like got away from that for a long time and just with things that were going on in my life. When I was making Hissing Fauna and especially like recording that song, just uh, didn't really have the feeling that I needed to protect myself from the world. I just really wanted to express that. So yeah, I guess it is probably the closest that I've come to being completely <clears throat> not self-conscious and and just making something in the moment. But I think it, it helped that I was basically just like, yeah, I'm just singing this song to Nina, I'm not really singing it to anybody else. I fell in love with the first cute girl that I met Who could appreciate George Bataille Standing at a Swedish festival Discussing story of the eye Yeah, so there's a Swedish festival called Emma Boda, and for whatever reason, they would have American bands play it sometimes. And so this other band that I was playing in got to play there one one year, and then they invited us back, and then Of Montreal was also allowed to play. So um, that's where I met her when I was at that festival, that she came with her friend, and who was like involved with the indie underground music scene in Norway and like put on shows and stuff for different bands. And so that's how we met. And all that stuff is like straight from our experience of like, I loved Story of the Eye when I was like 16, 17 years old or something. And I read it, I think Bjork mentioned it in an interview that I was reading and it's like totally changed my life. And But I'd never met anybody for whatever reason. I just hadn't really hung out with people that read a lot or watched a lot of movies or whatever. And so meeting her, I was very impressed that she not only knew that, but knew a lot of stuff that I didn't know. So yeah, that's like directly connected to that conversation and the first time I met her and all that. Performance breakdown And I don't want to hear it I'm just not available Things could be different But they're not Stop! 
I think we both loved uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Can't remember all the lyrics, but yeah, there's definitely some references to different things that, that we both enjoyed or things that we experienced together. But just, yeah, the character in, in the play who screams violence, violence, when uh, the other two main characters are fighting. And just the intensity of that relationship, I guess on some levels, was something that we could identify with. The main married couple in that movie being extremely close, but having been together for a very long time and experienced a lot of trauma and pain together and are sort of seemingly very much committed to each other, but are also very damaged people and sort of lose themselves and forget like to be caring <laughs> towards each other and just the weird games that they invent, the weird like role playing games that they invent to sort of keep things interesting and to sort of vent the frustration that is just inherent in every relationship, especially if it's been going on for like 15 years or something. So I think, I don't think that we could really identify with, with that experience necessarily, but on some level, you know, obviously you don't have to experience it to relate to it, but just the powerfulness of it. I mean, definitely, I, I've read the play, the Edward Albee play, but the film version is, is really great because it's, you know, Elizabeth Taylor's amazing and Richard Burton's amazing. So just the two of them, they had such an incredible dynamic that I think that, for whatever reason, kind of romanticized it a bit. Do I have to scream in your face? I mean, yeah, it's just one of the few songs that it's just the same four chords throughout the whole song, and it's a really long song. So definitely wouldn't be something that I would normally even consider doing. But yeah, it is kind of just like a vamp, and it's just a way for me to get all this stuff off my shoulders. And so in that way, yeah, I just wanted to keep it musically kind of more simplistic. Definitely the vocals were the thing that I wanted to highlight, but I also wanted the music to feel very alive and emotive and connected to the emotions of the song. So there's a lot of kind of like growling sounds. There's a lot of like kind of nefarious animal sounds. And so think of that as like, kind of like what I was at that time, just sort of like an animal in pain. I'm so touched by your goodness. When I was recording Pastures of Grotesque Animals, I think that you know, the initial recording where I just sort of laid down, this is like whatever, the 16 minute version, I don't think I like slumped down into a, a fetal position or anything, but it's kind of just like, huh, okay. Just like, you know, cause I was recording it by myself, I was alone. So, you know, it's kind of like, it's interesting how it is when you work alone. There's nobody else in the room, nobody else to like see anything that's going on. So you just sort of do it and then it's over and then it's quiet. And then you think about it. What did I just do? Reply, I was judging her friend as the DJ played a dead gem. No one wants 
to dance, they're outside smoking cigarettes. There's a bar in Athens called the Go Bar. It doesn't exist anymore, but it was for a long time. Everyone's like favorite bar, basically. It's like very cool, chill people that work there, and they'd have a lot of awesome bands playing. And it was kind of like, you know, one of the cooler spots in Athens. Bunny is definitely, you know, directly from an experience I had. And like an asshole, I didn't change the names to protect the innocent. So Evo is actually a person that I knew, and the whole experience is like straight from what happened one night. But I don't know why I said the thing about the soul power or any of that stuff. It's, it's a mean song, you know, and, and I, but I think it's just the way it's, you know, very common for me to not really think about the ramifications of something that I'm singing about and just sing it because that's what I feel like singing about at the moment. And then later on being like, ugh, why did I do that? Eva, I'm sorry, but you will never have me. To me, you're just some faggy girl, and I need a lover with soul power. And you ain't got no soul power. Eva, I'm sorry, but you will never Well, there's a weird experience. One time we were playing a show in Athens and Eva actually got on stage and I was like, oh no. And while we were playing it and she kind of like pretended like she was going to kick me in the face. <laughs> but luckily she didn't. Or I'm not, sure she, I'm not sure what her pronouns are. I shouldn't say she. They didn't, I don't know. But uh, I think that kind of made me feel like they were like chill with it on some level and just thought it was like funny. It would have been intense if they would have like strangled me or like shot me or something. Yeah, Fabergé was something, it was the first time I ever, I think I ever really used a sample in a song that was, you know, something just completely <clears throat> random that had no connection to anything. There's two records that I had that were like Dixieland music. I was just kind of fooling around just trying to make something in the studio and, and I was wanting to experiment with doing some samples. And so I chose these two Dixieland records that, you know, deeply obscure, just kind of like the sound of New Orleans in 1951 or something. And it wasn't anybody famous or anything. So I, I've never been sued for it. I don't think anybody would really be able to pick out what the samples were from, luckily. But so that whole like, that's like two different samples that I chopped up and, and put together. And then I pitched it up and, and back down again, just for that intro thing. And then Musically, when it, when it goes into the kind of funkier part, it's definitely thinking, well, it's great because it was, it was fun to make something musically that I could express this persona through the Georgie Fruit persona that was sort of starting to evolve. I think of that song probably as the most Georgie of all. The Fabergé egg, you know, was something that I worked at a flower shop when I was in high school and there was a man 
who uh, was traumatized as a child deeply and all of his hair fell out and never grew back. And he was very into creating Fabergé eggs. So it became like this weird thing in my imagination, just thinking about this person making these Fabergé eggs and thinking about like a Fabergé waterfall or the Fabergé egg falling and shattering and just the pain that that would cause. And But I think, yeah, Shogi was somebody that I was listening to a bunch at that time. And and so it's like this combination of sort of semi-abstract poetic lyrics and more direct sexual references and and just things that were going on, like, I can't take the stage straight. It was like a sort of that feeling I had of like, I need to be kind of addled to be on stage so I can like really get into the the groove of what I wanted to do because I'd be like too uptight or whatever if I was sober. Yeah, so there's just so many different references in that song. Yeah, I love, I always love the way Prince, when Prince would get really weird in songs and just like say something in a weird voice and then scream. <laughs> you know, it's like really inspiring to me. Like there's some songs on controversy where he's like talking, he just says like weird stuff, like the inventor of the AccuJack, you know, just will like say some random thing. And that is something that I thought was so cool. I do that a lot in my songs too, but then that like, making just like crazy animal noises. It feels, you know, it's like very emotive to do that. You know, it feels like you're sort of exercising some like weird sex demon. Yeah, because like the Georgie Fruit character is a very sexual character. And that whole time period for me was this period of exploration. Yeah, it was like, this, you know, a couple year long sexual adventure, sexual walkabout to do a 30 Rock reference be careful how you touch me my body is an earthquake ready to receive you my mind's making gracious metals for my soldiers let's be like strangers touching for the first time I remember one day just like sitting on my couch and just like writing kind of like free verse style and, and thinking, you know, what would be some interesting titles that I could create. And so those things, the controller's fear and skeletal lamping and false priest were three things that popped into my head and I wrote them down. And I thought it'd be, it would be cool because more so at that time, really than any other time, I was feeling very creatively inspired and was very productive and I was making a lot of things at the same time and and like once the record would be done I would start another one right away like how quickly I made skeletal lamping after this and how quickly I made false priest after that and so I kind of knew in my head like what I wanted to do next So I think, yeah, I experimented with different song or different lyrics on Labyrinthian Pomp and definitely, you know, that Georgie Fruit character probably played a large role in this, like things that I would say as Georgie Fruit that I probably wouldn't say as Kevin Barnes. And just thinking of like what this character would, how this character would talk, how this character would communicate and 
what kind of language it would use. And so like, how are you going to tag my style? So like tagging, like a graffiti thing, like basically how are you going to like trash me and, and the way that I live when you're like nothing or whatever, you know, just kind of like being like kind of, I know like a lot of people, like I've been bullied a lot, you know, like when I was in high school and stuff, cause I was different. And like a lot of people who were sort of bullied, you see like, wow, oh, this person is bullying me, but they're like, nothing they're like basically subhuman there's they're not there's nothing special about them it's insane that they feel like they could be talking shit to me you know so sort of like a reference to that and then the verses there's some this idea that i had of this fantasy of like smashing all the windows in my neighbor's houses obviously you know it's like i have some impulse control but that was something that i was (laughs) thinking about that would be really wild like in the middle of the night to just like break that like very serious social taboo and just like smash people's windows your neighbors you know especially like kevin the fuck are you doing people who know you you know but i mean that song is very much i think about it as that time period where nina and i were renting this house in this one neighborhood and it was very much connected to that neighborhood in my mind and like the vibe of of the neighborhood and Alibi being like, you know, one or, I guess she's, yeah, like one year old, one and a half or something, one and a half, two years old, and having friends in the neighborhood, having a trampoline in the backyard. Things are definitely like a little bit better at this point in my life, feeling a little bit more frisky and happy. Let's just say you are not the destroyer. You are not the destroyer. Let's just say Do I get that some other Well, I was very influenced from an early age by Prince. And Prince is interesting because obviously he has, his roots are in, in like more black uh, genres of music, like R&B and soul and things like that. So yeah, maybe on some level thinking, well, a white person can't really do that sort of thing without, it's just like blue-eyed soul or blue-eyed R&B, whatever, even though I have brown eyes. <laughs> Yeah, so I think that maybe saying like, oh yeah, Georgie Fruit's a, a black transgender person or whatever, that because that's really the kind of music that I was in love with and wanting to make and wanted to feel like it was okay to do it and not that it was like some sort of appropriation or some like cheap facsimile of the thing. You know, I wanted it to feel authentic. So how do I make it feel authentic? I have to become something that I'm not, maybe. But all this stuff is just going on in my head. I'm not as like self-conscious as that might seem. It's kind of more like fun, you know? It's just play acting. So I didn't really spend that much time thinking about what is Georgie Fruit or what kind of character should I create to help me become more liberated as an artist and a songwriter and a performer. That it was more just... Um, this organic thing that was just happening and then other people obviously will witness it, know about it, have opinions about it, but I haven't really, obviously, because maybe I wouldn't have done it if I had been more conscious of the outside world. Got my Georgie fruit on. He's a dark mutation for my demented pastime. Giving replicators somewhere to go, but we're authentic. You can test my talent. Yeah, so the Georgie Fruit character is very problematic. And it's interesting just because, like, if you live inside your head and, and you don't really think about the outside world, then you're not really, like, looking out for anybody else. It's basically just your own art adventure. And so the Georgie Fruit character was just basically this adventure that I went on. But 
now because we're all, you know, more in touch with each other's feelings and um, looking out for each other more, I you know, sort of realized the Georgie Fruit character, although what I was trying to create was basically a character that was completely fluid, wasn't trapped by any gender, race, sexual preference or whatever, just like the perfect kind of polymorphous persona. And so that's why I said that it had multiple sex changes and it was sort of just bouncing around between genders and sort of thinking of it more as like kind of like a chameleon, zealot sort of character, you know, less than a specifically black transgender character. So I really was kind of at that time just picking something that was very foreign to what I was physically. So I shouldn't have given it any race. That's kind of like what I realized, sort of the takeaway currently. Like I shouldn't have given it any race or any gender. It should have just been completely free. And it should have been a character that, you know, nobody could say what it was. It wasn't specifically anything. It's great that we are evolving. It's exciting to see the evolution. That's why I never, I don't mind being called out for for being insensitive about something. It's really actually helpful for someone to say like, hey, this thing is, this thing is going on in the background. You don't know about it because it's not your scene or whatever, but this group of people is upset by what you're saying. It's, it's hurting them. It's causing them emotional pain. Like, do you care? It's like, I do care. I don't want anyone to feel emotional pain because of something that I did or, you know, because a character that I had created. So, you know, basically when I went through like a process of, of at first being like, oh my God, this is so stupid. Like, this is just like a persona that I created a long time ago. I haven't even thought about it in forever. Why do you care? Why does it matter to anybody that this thing happened 15 years ago, or whatever? Like, why does it bother anybody? Because, you know, but then it's like the thing that I learned, it's like, just because I don't understand it doesn't mean that it's not real. And it doesn't mean that other people aren't feeling it. You know, it's like, I think we all struggle with that idea that, well, I wouldn't be offended, so you shouldn't be offended. Or you have no right to be offended because I personally wouldn't be offended. You know, so when you realize that, like, yeah, it doesn't matter what I would be offended by. Like, if this is offending these other people. And then I have to ask myself, do I care or do I not care? And I do care because I don't want to offend trans people. You know, that is the last thing I'd want to do. I want to support them, give them love, and uh, do everything I can to create a more positive environment for everybody like that. So that's when I realized like the apology was important in trying to say, like, I get it. I understand why it would be, how it could be upsetting. Yeah, that one is kind of, I think of it almost like, was definitely like kind of the more most rock and roll thing on the record. And I always love, you know, like Iggy and the Stooges and MC5 and Velvet Underground when they're like super rocked out. And of course, like Bowie has awesome rock songs. And so it's definitely kind of feeling inspired by that and wanting to make something that had that groove to it. it. It also has a little bit, I remember at the time, that song House of Jealous Lovers was really popular and I really liked the way that song sounded and so I kind of wanted to make a song that had a bit of that energy to it. That song's pretty problematic in a way, like 
saying you want to hit somebody, especially if you say you want to hit a woman. I mean, at least there's some self-restraint saying, like, I'm not going to hit you, but I want to pay some other girl to hit you. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of like sassy, but, you know, definitely like kind of like tongue in cheek. It's, it's meant to be playful. It's not meant to be serious. Song. I feel like at that time I, I felt like I was very much, or thinking back on it now, it seemed like I was very much in some sort of like protective bubble where I wasn't second guessing anything or being critical or even like being like sensitive which I've had a problem, I guess you could say it's a problem, like for a long time of being insensitive in songs because I'm not really, when I'm making them, I'm just in the moment and I'm not thinking about anyone ever hearing them. And then when they're done, I kind of forget that the outside world exists and that people are going to hear it and then potentially be offended, upset, hurt, or whatever. But I don't, yeah, I don't think... Luckily, I don't say anybody's name, and she's a rejecter, so nobody has to feel like I'm directly attacking them or whatever. Yeah, so that song is about me and, and Nina and Alibi. And Alibi, when Nina and I were separated, Alibi would take a photo of me and bring it to bed with her every night. And that just really broke my heart, you know? And that's like one of the big reasons why I really wanted us to get back together and really wanted to be in her life because it's so sad to think about. So I'd make a reference to that in the song, She Takes My Photo to Bed, was about Alibi. And just kind of like, like, yeah, I know I'm a very messy person and fucked up and insensitive, but yet this beautiful little creature loves me and like wants me to be a part of her life. Night eyes reducing ashes We love to view unfortunate passions Still she takes my photo to bed We called Alibi our leafling. So I this sort of thought that we had been re reincarnated lovers or whatever, and, but we were always freaks, and so that's why the title, We Were Born the Mutants Again, this time with Leafling. So yeah, just kind of like a sweet reference to our, you know, like our little family at that time. Yeah, so it's funny because I talked to my therapist about this a while ago, and they were saying like how unhealthy it is to think of you and your partner as twins or that like it's you you know in a way it's like the whole thing of like it's us against the world in a way that kind of says like you lose your individuality like you don't have to like morph with another person to have a healthy loving relationship but I think at that time like the Sunlinic twins was a reference to Nina and in Heimdall's Gata I say Nina twin and just sort of thought of her as my my twin, but like more of like my, my art twin, you know, because I respected her so much. I respected her brain and, and the things that she created. And I would always refer to her as Nina twin. When I finished the record, uh, she hadn't really heard much of this, many of the songs. And I basically just like left her alone. I think Al Alibi was in bed. So it was like later at night and I just left her with like the headphones and, and the record and, and she listened to it and she was crying and but like really happy felt like it was you know a really good record and didn't feel upset about anything that I was sharing with the world or whatever and just felt my pain and knew that it was you know really in a lot of ways our record because it in so many ways was also her experience that I was singing about
Well, it's funny when Hissing Fauna was finished and like we were playing it for people <clears throat> when I would like play it for friends and stuff and they all seemed to kind of be like, wow, this is really good. This is, you know, kind of like implying like the rest of your stuff's okay, but this is like really good. Kind of surprised. So that was like, oh, okay. It makes me happy. But it actually leaked like way early. I think it had leaked on the internet like three months before it came out or something. So we're like, oh my God. You know, at the time it seemed like bad news because people were still buying CDs back then. And, you know, I was like, oh, well, if it's already leaked, then probably won't sell very well. The label was like kind of freaked out about it. But I think it actually helped the record because, you know, buzz was growing so much by the time the record came out that a lot of people were excited about it, wanted to hear it. <clears throat> so when it came out, it was very kind of instantly, like Pitchfork gave it a really good review, and the shows were going really well, and we were kind of playing like bigger and bigger venues. So it was like around this time where like places that we used to play, like the kind of the, the indie circuit that we used to play, where you know if we were lucky, we might get 100 people at a show, where most often there'd be like 12 people at the show. Now th those places were selling out, and there was like a line around the block. And so that was like really exciting to see, you know, like the evolution of that and, you know, to have our 15 minutes of fame was really exciting. And especially after like so many years of being totally obscure and feeling like a complete loser, it was nice, you know, to be special, to feel special for a little bit of time. So I remember that, that time period, I have like, you know, really positive feelings about it. But then it was also, you know, the same problem that existed with Sun Atlantic Twins, you know, where like the record's doing really well, but my marriage is not doing well because I have to be gone all the time. And it definitely makes you kind of grow apart the more time you spend away from each other. And, you know, she's, Nina was back at home with Alibi and like having to be basically like a single mom and I was out on the road. So yeah, it was, you know, it was good and bad. <laughs> from that perspective, but from just, you know, if I forgot that I had a daughter and a wife back home, then it, you know, it was a pretty exciting time period. Definitely like Kevin's wild years. This was definitely the most commercially successful record and critically acclaimed time period, you know, because like pretty much quick, really quickly after this, all the critics started like shitting on me. So this is like the tiny period because like critics were shitting on me from the beginning up until Hissing Fauna and then they liked Hissing Fauna and then they hated everything else. So this was like my one little window where people liked, or it seemed like everybody liked me. It's like, okay, cool. But then it quickly turned. But that's the way, <clears throat> that's the way it goes, you know? I was lucky to have that little moment, you know, because most people are just hated their whole lives and they never are liked for even a second. So I feel happy that there was a little period of time where people liked me. I could be like, oh, I'm not just like the hissing fauna person. Like I've done other things, but... You know, it's just like anything else. Like you have that, if you're lucky, you have that one record that people like, you know, and it's the thing that makes you special or gives you like cultural relevance or whatever. And it, it would be easy to be like, to feel weird about it, you know, and feel like there's more to me than just this thing that I did 15 years ago, which I, I totally feel that way. Obviously, I don't really like care that much about Hissing Fauna, but I think it's cool that other people do. And it definitely feels good when you play a song on stage and people recognize it and they're happy that you're playing it, you know, because that's a rare thing. I think that it would be stupid of me not to appreciate. I think it's cool that people can still get something out of something that I made so long ago. So 15 years, some people still like it, but just imagine how much people are going to like it in 1,015 years. I'm just playing.
We'll see. We'll check back in in 1,015 years and see if people still care. Visit lifeoftherecord.com for more information about Of Montreal. You'll also find a link to stream or purchase Hissing Fauna, Are You the Destroyer? Thanks for listening. 